So there are they the ones that you think will win the cup at the end of no. the day? I mean, no. no. Who's no. Right? Who, is <laughs> Who is it? Let's go. Um, will Bruce Boudreau land in one of the recently vacated spots in the NHL? Will Minnesota get out of the first round against Vegas? Will Kirill Kaprizov lead postseason play? All of these questions answered, plus the athletic Shana Goldman joins us to talk analytics on your favorite wild players. Presented by Soda Stick, brought to you by Jim Beam, Better Edge, and State Farm Insurance agent Tony Hoagland. This is episode 73. Gear up with the hottest merch in the state, courtesy of SodaStick.com. Snag a throwback Tony Oliva hitting school tee to celebrate baseball season, or keep the hockey vibes year-round with a plethora of on-ice merch. Be sure you're staying tuned to our social channels for a chance at a $50 Soda Stick gift card giveaway. Bar Down Beauties at checkout will always get you that free shipping. Happy shopping. At Jim Beam, they know the importance of tradition, like chanting Let's Play Hockey prior to the start of each game, or playing the State of Hockey anthem after a wild win. This season, raise one to your fan family with the bourbon that invites us all to come as friends and leave as family. Jim Beam Bourbon Whiskey, the official bourbon whiskey partner of the Minnesota Wild and XL Energy Center. Remember, drink smart. Jim Beam Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey, 40% alcohol by volume, copyright 2021. James B. Beam Distilling Company, Incorporate Claremont, Kentucky. Hello, everybody. We're back. Episode 73 of Bar Down Beauties. We got a good one. Lots of hockey to talk about it. Let's just dive right in. Alexis, should we start with Stanley Cup playoffs? Oh, yeah. Oh, let's, yeah. Why, why don't we start with roll. that? I know. Yeah. I mean, you wrap up the regular season on Thursday in St. Louis. We don't need to talk about that crap of a yeah. game. No, um, that never happened. <laughs> it never happened. I'm sure Alexis has plenty of thoughts in her breakdown. Go check that out. Yes. But uh, <laughs> Sunday, we're obviously recording this on a Friday. You're listening on a Monday. So game one in the books. However, Minnesota Wild blessed. I'm going to say blessed because it's the hockey gods doing a nice thing and giving them the Vegas Golden Knights in round one. Alexis, how pumped were you to see that Colorado beat the teams that they should beat in their last five in order to win out and claim the president's trophy and thus get out of the Minnesota's wilds way in the first round. Okay. Well, first of all, I don't trust the hockey gods for shit. So I, <laughs> I think they're up to something and I think this is a plot and something is not going to go well. Um, I don't trust the hockey gods, but I will say that as far as like the fun factor goes, I do think that the matchup against the golden Knights is going to be a much more fun first round matchup for the wild than Colorado. Like the wild and Colorado have had some like fun games. They had the overtime game, the wild beat them eight to three at one point in the season. Like they've had fun games, but the wild and Vegas games all season have just been like the most exciting games to watch. They've been back and forth. How many times have we been like clamoring all season? Like this needs to be a seven game series. Like we're going to get it. Yes. Yes. Let's go. Like they have been the, like, I just think across the league, like I think one of the most fun matchups this season has been the Minnesota wild against the golden Knights. And so I am very excited to see them play each other in the first round. I will say this though, at the end of the day, I have started to shift my mindset. The older I get that it truly doesn't matter who you play in the playoffs. Like you just need to beat them. Like whether we would have gotten Colorado, if the wild somehow would have gotten St. Louis, like whatever it would have been, you know, sure. You have certain matchups where it's like, Oh, this one might be easier or this one might be more exciting, but the wild might have to play Colorado in the second round. They might have to play the freaking St. Louis blues. And if that happens, I'm going to be upset because they've played like crap against the blues all season. So, um, but yeah, first round, let's try to get through that one first. I think it's going to be a good time. Um, and I think the wild, uh, have a good chance to, to get out of this first round, uh, with a victory. I mean, you're going to have to face Colorado eventually, whether it's now next route, you know, it's, you're always going to have to go through <laughs> yeah. a good team in order to get the cup. Uh, but I certainly think it makes it more exciting again. Like we, you just mentioned Alexis Vegas and Minnesota. It's been such a fun game to watch, not only because Minnesota has come out on the right side of, of the scoreboard most nights yeah. too, but it's just, there's so much tension already built up the regular season. We saw that play playoff like atmosphere. Yep. It's just been absolutely phenomenal. Um, it's, it's going to be great. Obviously Vegas has the home ice advantage mm-hmm. and interesting mm-hmm. enough, they are allowing a lot of fans in their mm-hmm. arena. They have, they're actually capacity is 7,500, just over 7,500. Uh, Minnesota's still at that 4,500 mark um, to start things off. Obviously things Could are constantly changing. Soon, yeah. I think it should get bumped up. Yeah. With the new, um, plans in place, but Alexis, how exciting even just to have that extra 1500 in the stands for the playoffs. Is that going to be? Oh yeah. I think it's going to be awesome. And, and quite honestly, I think that 
home ice advantage is almost going to be like an equal advantage to both teams. Like I think no matter where these teams are playing, like just to have fans in the stands with the way this last year and this last season has been, I think they're going to be just as fired up, even though it's not their fans, it's just going to be the energy of having fans in the building for playoff hockey, I think is going to fuel both teams almost equally. Um, especially with the team like Vegas, who their fans are just like people trying to find something to do after being at the casino for 12 hours. So like, I don't, they don't even know what's going you on. Just, was that just like, time dragging Vegas fans right there. They're going to be real angry about that. Aren't they? That's like- fine. That's fine. I I can live with that. They can come for me. Um, but yeah, I think it's just going to be exciting for both teams, both, you know, coaching staffs, just everybody just to have that energy, because that is one of the best parts about playoff hockey is the fans, the energy that they bring and kind of the, the overall vibe of these games. Um, so I'm really excited, even though the wild don't have the home ice advantage, um, just to see and hear some fans, uh, in the stands in, in larger numbers here for the post season. I'm curious to see how it feels. I mean, I know I've covered a couple of the playoff runs that the Minnesota wild have had, and I feed off that energy, right? It's just a very cool yeah. atmosphere. The, the game ops go all out. So I'm curious to see how they kind of shift that a little bit with less fans, right? And then because you have everybody spaced, I mean, do you still get to do the state of hockey flag going mm-hmm. around the rink? Right. I mean, it's, it'll be very interesting, but I'm ultimately overall just thrilled that more people can come and watch this team. Yeah. I mean, regardless of it being playoffs or not, this, this team is really a very special team to watch mm-hmm. this year. Kirill Kaprizov and everybody else. It's very yeah. fun and exciting. So, I mean, certainly the fans of Minnesota absolutely deserve that. And I I'm so happy for everybody to get in moving on, you know, the wild obviously aren't the only team playing in the playoffs, you know, I don't oh, know really? that. I know we may talk <laughs> like they are, but they're not. Um, so as a reminder, your first round goes like this, you've got the avalanche who are the number one seed in the West against the St. Louis blues. You've obviously got Vegas and Minnesota. You've got the Toronto Maple Leafs and the Montreal Canadians and the Edmonton Oilers and the Winnipeg jets. Those guys actually will start later than everybody else because Canada still has to finish up some regular season games due to COVID situation. Classic Canada, classic Canada. <laughs> um, you've also got Pittsburgh, the New York Islanders. You've got the Washington capitals and the Boston Bruins, the Carolina hurricanes, national predators, and the Florida battle of Florida. Let's call it the I battle can't. of Florida. No, that that series is non-existent to me. The Florida Panthers and the Tampa Bay Lightning. Good for Coach Q getting (laughs) the Panthers into some uh, exciting times for sure. But Alexis, what other um, series are you pretty pumped about? I think honestly, and this is completely unbiased, and we talked to Shana Goldman of The Athletic about this too. The Wild Vegas one does seem like the most appealing because it's the most evenly matched. But what other uh, series are you going to be keeping an eye on? Um, I really like the Canadian series like that. I, that whole division has just really kept me interested all season. Um, and we talk about this with Shane as well, but I think the Maple Leafs uh, are, are a really good team this year and could, could maybe do something in the playoffs. They finally, for a fact, will not have to play the Boston Bruins for at least the first two rounds of the playoffs. So that's going to buy them well, um, because they always struggle against the Bruins. Um, so I, I wonder if maybe them not getting stuck against the Bruins, um, is going to help them pick up any, uh, wins here in the postseason. Um, and I really, Really, I don't think the Canadians are are all that great of a team. Like I think the Maple Leafs. I really get love out of that, that you're saying the round. Canadians. Like you say, a little. No, Canadians. I like it. What is? Yeah, like a little, <laughs> a little tough. But it's good. I like it. Yeah, I uh, I think the Maple Leafs stand a good chance there. I just think they they are one of those teams who it's like every year I'm surprised they don't make it further in playoffs. It's because they always run into the Boston Bruins and for is some it because reason you they love can't Austin beat Matthews them. And well, that too. Sad for him. And his yeah. mustache. Um. Yeah. So no, I I would love to see the Maple Leafs finally do something here in the postseason. And And I think, you know, Canada is like Minnesota with their hockey where those playoff series, anytime a Canadian team is in a playoff series, it's usually pretty lit. So I am, uh, I'm excited about that series as well. Uh, hopefully the Maple Leafs do something. I'm also like Loki kind of excited about the Bruins and capital series, because I do think that there is some like heavy hitters there, uh, between those two teams who could make that a really fun series. Um, I don't know who comes out on top in that series, but that's one that is kind of like a, a dark horse as far as like the fun factor goes for me, where I think that might be a really good matchup there. I mean, yeah, I, I would agree with that too. I, I love just the Canadian series, the yeah. teams up there in general. I think that's always very fun. And, and I'm a big fan of Toronto. I think they've always played mm-hmm. well and it's, it's very interesting. I'm a huge New York Islanders fan. And again, that's probably the Minnesota. Well, I feel like they don't get any respect. I think they're a lot like Minnesota where they just, well, get, they're very defensive. <laughs> yeah. And they just get no respect at all. Yeah. Like, I just think they're a team that 
nobody cares about or they're always kind of getting pooped on even because they win really so well. efficiently they just don't even stand out they're just yeah, like they go I get just, their shit done and then they move on with their day it's like right. okay. i i would like to cheer them on so i would i mean that series i'll probably keep an eye on too and obviously it's against yeah. pittsburgh um who credit to mike sullivan for managing to get this team into the playoffs like he did when they were just riddled with injuries yeah um so that'll be good and i think obviously the abs in st louis the, again those are two teams that we know quite well here in minnesota i think that'll be exciting Speaking of the first round of the Stanley Cup playoffs, we are teaming up with our friends at Better Edge for a new competition called Beat the Butte. I'm the Butte, Jesse. I want you to try your hand at beating me in picking your first round teams. Simple, simple rules. If you beat me, you win. If uh, I beat everybody, I win. If you don't beat me and, and others do, you just don't get paid. So it's a lot of fun. Let's give it a shot. I'll even toss you a free $10 with code Buttes, B-E-A-U-T-S, when you sign up at Better Edge. Again, that's at Better Edge at B-E-T-T-O-R edge.com. Let's go. Y'all know how much I hate losing. So let's see if you, uh, if you know hockey better than me. We'll see you uh, on the app and stay tuned to both of our social channels. We've got some exciting new graphics and videos that producer Fred's been working on uh, to push out to you guys and, and promote a really cool platform run by uh, some really great local guys. So uh, be sure to check that out. Alexis, let's talk coaching now. Let's shift gears a little bit, sticking with Still the it. NHL. Um, obviously a lot of coaches ousted David Quinn of the New York Rangers uh, talk it in Arizona. They agreed that they will not return um, next season. And then torts. He's also out of uh, Columbus. <laughs> not, okay. Who do you, I mean, again, we get into this a little bit with Shane at, as far as New York, but do you think yeah. torts lands another job? Do you think our buddy Bruce Boudreaux lands a job somewhere with a couple of these openings? Um, I, I really do think that, I mean, John Tortorella, I know that he, let's start with him. Uh, John Tortorella gets oh, a lot. Oh, weird. Of, <laughs> you want to start there? Like, we don't want to start anywhere else. I just have so many thoughts on this. Um, he gets a lot of heat, I think, for the way that he goes about his coaching. And I think he gets labeled as an old, a quote unquote, old school coach a lot, um, which I think is a little bit unfair. And the thing is, is he actually is really good with the younger guys. So I do think that a team like New York would maybe benefit from having somebody like John Tortorella. I mean, New York has one of the better like farm teams and, and prospect uh, pools uh, in the NHL. So I like the idea of a guy like John Tortorella going back to New York, back to New York. <laughs> um, he was already there before, but that would be kind of fun to bring him back. Uh, I, I like that idea, although I don't know how likely that would be. My thing with John Tortorella, I want him to be rehired by the Vancouver Canucks. Me just listing teams to rehire him. Like they're not going to do this, but I want to be rehired. I mean, that's rehired. probably going to be an opening, right? They haven't announced Travis Green out, but I know they True. have not been happy with Travis Green in Vancouver. So it's possible. I just want the Calgary and John Tortorella beef. Like I just, I need that back in my life. So that would be fun. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I think John Tortorella still has a lot to offer in the NHL. We'll see where he ends up. I think he'd also be great. Kind of like a guy like Bruce Boudreau, a uh, great TV personality as well. So if yeah. he doesn't land a coaching job, um, you know, in this for this next season, um, maybe something that he can do uh, with media, I think would be really fun to see him. I do think Bo Bruce, he'd be like a it. Stephen A, right? Like, I yes. feel like he would be screaming, screaming all the time. Media. Blasphemy. Yeah, that I would mean, be it's John either that Or as a media person who has covered him, he never says anything. So also, I think he might be <laughs> terrible at media. I'm not really yeah, sure. We'll which see. He might go. grow into it. Um, <laughs> but I know when we had uh, Boudreaux on, this was about a year ago now on the podcast. Um, wow, time flies. Um, he was saying how he, you know, really wants to coach still. So I think, uh, Boudreaux still has that desire to coach. And I think that he has a lot to offer. He's coached a lot of really good teams. He's coached a lot of really good players. And I think if you look at his resume, even though, um, he, he maybe doesn't have all of the, uh, tangible accolades that you look for in a coach, he's got a lot of the, uh, intangibles. And, um, so I do think that there's a chance there for him. I don't know if a place like New York or Arizona would be a good fit for Boudreaux. I think the Arizona Coyotes should just go without a coach and see what happens. That's my theory. Um, but Jesse, if you have any opinions, wow. I'd love to hear them. <laughs> I, just Arizona, Vegas, just Go crap list. on everybody that's in the, in the Honda West. I'm going on um, a rampage. <laughs> I mean, I, I go back and forth. You have obviously Gerard Gallant also still out there. If he's interested in coaching, I know last we had heard he wasn't right. Um, but I do yeah. kind of like, as much as I love the guy, you know, the guys that we know, the household names, like the torts, like the Boudreaux, um, you know, Dean Evson has made me start to try to think outside and see oh, what okay. else might be out there and just kind of mix it up a little bit. You know, we keep continuously talking about the need for change in hockey and how it's just yeah. a bunch of old white men 
doing everything, which is so true. I was on a call with a bunch of them. I was the only chick, even, <laughs> you know, it's, I think, you know, getting somebody new, getting a fresh face in there, somebody with a completely different perspective than maybe the NHL has seen, especially in New York. I mean, there's a yeah. lot of pressure that would come with that for the Rangers, but I mean, they're an original six team. So to see them make a move like that would be very interesting and maybe possibly change the way that coaches are, are viewed mm-hmm. around the league or Arizona. I mean, try it out there too. I mean, just give somebody else a shot than putting the same guys back yeah. in over and over again, I think is always kind of interesting keeping on the coaching theme because you know, I love my segues. Segway! <laughs> um, Jack Adams or people have been talking about Dean Ebsen as a possible person getting some votes. I mean, what are your thoughts there? I know we've again, talked at length about how much he has done to be a part of the success of this team, but there's been so many great coaches. Mm-hmm. I had talked about Quinville and Florida, obviously making their, um, Rob Bridenmore in, in Col- or Carolina, excuse me, is one of my yep. favorites, Jared Bednar in Colorado. I mean, yep. there are so many, but do you think Dean warrants a, a worthy look for coach of the year in the league? I think he warrants a look. Is he going to be the front runner for the award? I hesitate to say yes to that question, but I will say that at the beginning of the season and even midway through the season, I mean, Jesse, I think you and I were both on the same train of thought of, you know, is Dean Evison ready for this? Let's see what he can do by mid season. He was maybe starting to prove people wrong that yes, he is ready for this job and he's done a lot with this Minnesota wild team, but it really took me up until uh, very recently for me to actually think about what he's done and say, okay, maybe I need to give him even a little bit more credit. I mean, think about some of the things that he's done in his, in his season here with the Minnesota wild from benching a guy like Zach Parisi to benching, you know, Kevin Fiala late in the game because he turns the puck over to mixing up the lines to doing this, to doing that. I mean, he has been so unafraid to make those big moves that I think previous Minnesota wild coaches and just coaches in general in the NHL are sometimes afraid to make. And I respect, uh, the, the bravery that he has and the audacity at times that he has to make the some audacity. Of the calls. <laughs> there it is. I mean, that is a compliment. Um, but I just think that, you know, especially your first season as a head coach in the NHL and first season with a team. I think some coaches are a little scared to make some of those moves. And Dean Evison has been completely fearless when it comes to those kind of things. And I think for that reason alone, and a lot of the things he's done has paid off and worked well for him. And I think for that reason alone, he definitely warrants a look. But as you mentioned, Jesse, there's a lot of, of coaches who deserve a look uh, for the Jack Adams this season in the NHL. So uh, I don't know if he'll win it, but uh, it, it, it's really cool that people are even talking about that because I don't think anyone expected that at the beginning of the season. No, and and I'm completely in the same boat, so I won't... Uh just repeat what you said. But yeah, I mean, I think, like I said, I was not in the Dean Evson boat to begin with. It certainly has changed. I see mm-hmm. a lot of the good that he's done to the team, but I just think there are so many other coaches yeah. that have really done more and it's only Dean's first year. You know, if he continues right. this trend upward, certainly it can come back around, but I think Carolina and Florida have done so much more in their time under their mm-hmm. coaching regime that those guys probably are going to be higher up, at least on my list. I don't get a vote anyway, so it doesn't matter, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Give us votes. <laughs> give the buttes votes. <laughs> exactly. We'll see. And then uh, final thing I want to talk about goalie tandem quick and quick and short. What are we going to do? Are you going to see more of cam Talbot or is Dean Epson going to split them? I mean, truthfully, Capo's kind of fallen off. Right. Mm-hmm. And we talked a little bit about some possible kind of mismanagement but Cam has struggled a little bit too. That yeah. brilliant tandem we had at the beginning or middle of the year has kind of <laughs> seemed to slip away a little bit. I think you got to go with Talbot to start. Uh, Dean and Bill made it very clear at the beginning of the season. Talbot's your guy. Now you got to put your money where your mouth is. Let him lead this team into the playoffs. See what he's capable of. Uh, we, as Wild fans, have unfortunately seen it too many times where a somewhat average or maybe slightly above average goalie stands on their head and wins a playoff series. And Talbot is not one of the best goaltenders in the league, but he is very good and he's done a lot of good for this Minnesota Wild team. I think he's earned his right, even though it, you know in in the last handful of games here he hasn't looked as good good. Um, every, every player and every team is going to go in ups and downs in a season, even the superstars. And, uh, maybe he just hit a little slump there, but I think you got to give him a chance to try to prove himself. And, uh, I've really been completely unimpressed with the way Kakanen has played lately to the point where I do not trust him to lead this team into the playoffs. So give it to Talbot. And if you need to lean on Kakanen at some point, you better hope that he can be there because, uh, he struggled a bit as of late. So that's wow. what I would say. Just you're a little savage, a little feisty. Why today, I don't know what's going on. Yeah, you're I like a little Jesse. Yeah, I like geez, it. you're I like rubbing it. off on me. <laughs> <laughs> we talk more about that in this week's YouTube exclusive cues with the beauty. So be sure to go check that out. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, Shayna Goldman. Stay tuned. 
Want to rep some Bar Down Beauties merch? We've got you covered, literally. Whether you want to show that you're an official beaut or that you do not, in fact, support Chirping Duluth, we've got it all. So make sure you check out Bar Down Beauties on Teespring. We're back. Joining us now, dog mom, analytics guru, with a knack for some great storytelling and podcasting on her own podcast, along with some others, uh, Too Many Men, Shana Goldman. Shana, how are you? How are how are things in New York with the Rangers, your <laughs> primary the tea. beat? Let's start right there. New York Rangers primary beat writer. How's that going for you? <laughs> it's, wi- it, it's literally wild. Um, everything is happening so quickly and it's things that once the first ball dropped, you kind of expected the rest to be like, okay, this is, this is how this off season is going to go. So like once it started, now, you know where you're at, but it, it, all of it is just so crazy. There's so much going on all the time. You kind of figured like, this is a team ready to take the next step for the playoffs. And they were going to like make some changes, of course, but to the extent that they did, it was something I don't think anybody saw coming. And the timing of everything, of course, like drew up so many more storylines because it's like, Oh, <laughs> Well, there was a statement and they disagree with it. And now that's the, like, that's why they got fired. And who knows what played into everything. And I think whenever it's a James Dolan team, when anyone like looks at the Knicks, they're like, well, we know what this could be. And it's like, oh, is this what it's going to be? Uh, and you've had drama from the beginning, really. I mean, oh you want to go back to Tony D'Angelo. It was like its own Broadway show out there in New York. You like that reference there? Yeah. But I mean, yeah. Well, how crazy just was it to, to cover the team? with all of the off ice stuff. I mean, you had mentioned they took a step forward. I mean, there was the big announcement by the Rangers saying, Hey, we're rebuilding. And they put out that statement and it looked like they were making those steps. But again, these off ice dramatics almost took away from some of the good things that they had started to accumulate on the ice. Yeah. It's, there's no soap operas, just hockey. (laughs) And the D'Angelo stuff was, I mean, honestly, since the day he was, since the, since he started his career, his hockey career, there's been like chaos to follow rightfully. So like, You know, I know a lot of people want to look at it and be like, oh, he grew, he evolved. And really, like, during the pandemic, that social media use, which he had previously gotten in trouble for. You have to keep in mind, his first year with the Rangers, he was demoted really soon. And, like, Mm -hmm. nerds over here were like, hey, that's the (laughs) wrong move. Like, forget about everything else for a second. Let's give him a clean slate. Sure, sure, sure. He should be playing the defense sucks. And he didn't. He went to Hartford. He sucked. And he (laughs) fought with people on Twitter. And so his, like, it seemed like his social media was limited by the team. It appeared that way, at least. Um, And then they really leaned into it. And that's what was so interesting about it. Like, they literally handed him a mic. And, and yes, it worked for some, like, funny content. But then everything during the pandemic, it really came to a head with that social media use and everything going on with that. That you're like, oh, this is going to, this, this is a situation. And then he came into the season, he didn't play well the first couple games. And he was instantly getting in trouble for things that you kind of thought they were past that with like the discipline on the ice and penalties and reacting to them and everything just went from there. I I mean, and then when you hear a story that a player gets punched by their teammate, I mean, like of all, (laughs) I almost forgot that that happened too, (laughs) right? Like, let's not forget that for the (laughs) Ranger. Yeah. Like, can you imagine, like, I I wonder how many goalies want to punch their defenders. (laughs) I can't, Probably you know, a lot. <laughs> yeah, like if I'm like, think Henrik Lundqvist, like the defense he played behind for over a decade. I can't imagine how many times he wanted to literally like <laughs> drop kick his teammates and be like, what are you doing in front of me? I don't need to face 50 <laughs> shots a night. But then this, of course, of all players, it was, it was a mess. And then you think of like everything else that transpired since. And you're like, okay, let's talk about like, I just want to talk about what's going on on the ice. Like <laughs> I don't get to go off with everything else. Like I stick to the analysis and I'm like, okay, there's, there's things happening constantly that you're like, how do you keep up with this? Well, and how Fine. difficult is it, you know, where we in Minnesota here kind of deal with it in a similar, but different way where, you know, Minnesota hockey fans are very vigilant. They know what's going on. They care a lot. New York is a big, uh, you know, sports town as well. Just a big city in general. Um, and as someone who works in media, does that kind of affect the way that stuff gets presented to, uh, the New York fan base? Do you have to do your job differently at all when these kind of big events happen? Um, well, Hockey, like, isn't as high up. So that's like the one, if this were the Yankees or the Giants or the Jets, and that's the thing too, every New York sports team, there's been just fiascos with. Like the Mets (laughs) are a walking, talking disaster. The Knicks, everything that's happened in the last, you know, five years you look at and you're just like, oh my God, how do you even like compete with that? So I think for hockey, like we do get a little bit of slack, but on the other hand, everyone is so impatient. Everybody wants it right now, the way they want it. 
and they turn on players on a dime too. And I'm sure you could say that with any fan base, there's going to be fans that like dislike how things go on, but I just feel like there's a lot more impatience at times. And then when you had the rebuild and everything, you did have a lot of fans pumping the brakes and just being like, Oh, this is nice. We don't normally get this. And maybe (laughs) it's like for the best, they're recognizing it. Yeah. But very quickly, it's like, why aren't they good this year? (laughs) They have Panarin and Zavanshi. Why aren't they good this year? And it's like, well, you know, it's, patience sometimes, right? You know, bringing it to the Minnesota fan base that we have here, Condre Miller, I know you were a big fan of his and in, in what you had seen of him. What do you like about his game? He's a Minnetonka native here from Minnesota playing for the Rangers. Very exciting for him. We saw good things from him here in the state of hockey. What did you see from him in the, the Rangers? He, he jumped into like a really big role. It was cool to see like he a lot of people didn't think he'd play a significant role off the bat. And you looked at the Rangers like defense corps and you're like, you know what, there, there's a room for him if he's ready for it. And it took a couple, his first game was rough, but so was everyone's. And the strides he took throughout the year, his skating is unbelievable. He has such a long stride, the way he can get back and forth. And you would see that against Sidney Crosby and Jack Eichel and Matthew Barzell. Like they're big players he's doing this against. It's not like he was getting like light minutes or anything because mm-hmm. the way they had to spread it out when you had the defense the Rangers did, like, you know, it led to him taking on those minutes. Um, his reach is incredible. And there were so many plays that you just see this like calmness and poise that I wouldn't expect from a player. And like the Rangers as a whole were better defensively and a year ago, maybe it would have been a different story, but he was a big part of why they were like, he really played well. He was able to kill penalties. He had moments where he was playing on the power play before Zach Jones came in and everything, you know, you can just see all this potential. And this is someone who didn't even play defense his entire life. Right. So it's so exciting to see what he can do. Like, He's answered him and Ryan Lingren are the two that answered so many questions, mm-hmm. maybe that were like left on that defense. The right side was kind of like solved with Truba and Fox and D'Angelo mm-hmm. or Nils Lunk was coming in, but the left there are a million questions. And mm-hmm. Ryan Lingren became the first pair defenseman they needed. And Kendra Miller right there on the second pair, like that's as ideal as it could be. Ryan Lindgren, another Minnesota guy. So we love to hear about that as well, obviously. <laughs> toot, toot, Minnesota horn. Um, do you see Condre sticking in that large role next year and moving forward? I mean, even with the coaching staff changes, which I also want to talk to, but do you think um, Condre continues to eat those big minutes up for the defense? I think so. Because now, like, that's the third pair is the one spot that they actually need to address now, especially on the left side. Like, I mean, maybe Brendan Smith plays and he'd play either side. But when Troop is healthy, I imagine that they're going to try to keep the two of them together. or yeah make it Miller Fox and then lingering true as like your true shutdown pair. And either way, I think it works really well. So I, I think he's going to stick in the top form role. I wouldn't be surprised if he steps back next year, just given like the changes, we don't know what kind of system the coaches will run. We don't, we don't know anything yet. Um, and sometimes like players do struggle in their second season, but I think that if he has like a, a normal off season and that's like such a big thing here, like he came into a year that was so chaotic as it was just given the current environment, um, with a full off season and training with the, you know, other players and the NHL staffs and things like that. Like I would imagine that he just keeps building on it because he's a player that really learns on the fly and adjusts and just, you know, thrives when he was given the time and, you know, minutes to do it. Right. Again, we're talking with Shana Goldman, athletic numbers guru and all around just awesome kick-ass human <laughs> being as usual. Um, you know, Shane, another change obviously made as of late with the Rangers, David Quinn, out who is your front Alexis and I kind of chewed on some of the coaching carousel that might happen in this offseason who would be your front runner to maybe take on that role as head coach of the New York Rangers who do you want to talk to who do you want to cover with right Bruce Boudreaux maybe (laughs) Boudreaux is interesting to me I do like him I think he'd be like you know he'd be a very good team and I like the defensive structure some of his teams have had um I do like Gerard Gallant a lot because I think he's someone that's willing to give young players minutes and mm-hmm. time and space to do what they need. And he runs an up-tempo, up-tempo system, which I think is so important here. You look at the forward talent that they have, and that's something that they just weren't generating offense at, at a high rate this year. And when you have Panarin and Zibanejad and Kako and Kreider and Strom and Jim, you're like, <laughs> okay, there's, there's a disconnect if the, you know, it's not working. So uh, faster system, and you look at like what Vegas plays, if that's what they can mm-hmm. try to emulate – I think that would be really ideal, but I'd love to see them go out of the box. I don't see it happening. I think that the NCAA was their out of the box pick and, you know, <laughs> oh, it worked for development. Now we want the next step and it's going to be someone that coached in the NHL recently. Mm-hmm. 
Well, let's, uh, you, we talked about some Minnesota born players. Let's talk about a player who's not Minnesota born, but currently playing here, which is uh, Kirill Kaprizov. Uh, we've talked about him in just about every episode since he's been here, uh, but it's he's our money to- boy, you know, he let's is. Go. <laughs> uh, but we've got someone on here, uh, from the East coast, uh, Shana, and we would love to have your opinion on what have you seen as someone who's not a Minnesota wild fan, doesn't cover the Minnesota wild. Uh, when you see someone like this, make a splash in the NHL, uh, what is kind of your reaction towards him? He's fantastic. He is a player. Every shift, you have to watch what he does. Um, His edge work is incredible. His eye for the puck, the way that you can see when a play is developing and he knows what to do, the way it just clicks and he just starts flying down the ice and has a plan and makes it happen. He's such a dangerous player all all over the place. Like he is one of the most exciting players to watch. And like, you know, I've watched the Wilds for a while and I, I know everyone's like, Oh, they're a boring team, and like, I like <laughs> I like defense. So I'm someone that's like, no, but it's fun, it's fun. But now you're like, no, 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 legitimately, it's fun. Look at what you can do. And um, I'm working on something with Mike Russo right now on Kaprizov to run before game one. So I'm just sitting here going through every quality scoring play he's on the ice for because I'm like, I want to see if I can pick out anything different from just the scoring plays and the way you get to watch him. Like they sometimes show that isolated, you know, view of him, and I'd like yeah. that throughout the playoffs. <laughs> every game I want to see just what he is doing and try to like get into his mind to to see like how he watches plays develop because it's just it, it, he's so talented he's everything anyone could have wanted and more right I mean he's surprised even us I think we've mm-hmm. been saying that from day one we knew he was going to be great but you never know how that really is going to translate what have you seen and not to give away obviously if you're working on the story with Russo but <laughs> what have you seen from his numbers that really does stand out even amongst just the wild players in general. I mean, we know he's leading and everybody knows what he can do, but what do the numbers actually say to us? So he plays a ton of ice time. And I think that's really notable. Like, yes, he is older of like the rookies. He's not 18 years old, but he plays the majority of the five on five minutes and he leads on power play time. Um, Individually, he's one of the best at creating quality chances. And like we use expected goals for that, which assigns a value to every shot attempt, every unblocked shot attempt. So you add that together and you get a player's expected goal value, and then you can turn it into a rate stat to weigh their ice time. Even when you weigh all the minutes that he plays, he's still one of the best at doing it in all situations because he's constantly getting those quality chances, whether it's some skillful play or if it's just getting dirty and going to the front of the net. You know, he's doing what you need and what you want to create offense um, individually. And, you know, we see with his passing too, that he's helping his, you know, his line mates drive play. And I mean, not to knock him, but it's not like he has this top caliber center he's doing it with either. You oh, know, trust we- Shana. We've been talking about that for weeks. You're not hurting anybody's feelings. Don't carry on. Yeah, yeah. I want to see Nico Stern play there. Like that's the play I really want to see with. Um, so many people are going to yep. applaud you for that right there. Yeah. Nico Stern. Shana says, put Nico Stern in, in the center. Yeah. Yeah, you're wasting him on the fourth line. Just put him, you know, put him higher in the lineup. Put him between Zuccarello. You have someone who can pass, someone who can shoot, and they can carry play. You know, mm-hmm. Rask has been doing fine there, and he he's playing better than anyone could have expected. But like, if you had someone that takes it up a notch, and that's what you want against Vegas, like that that's as ideal as it gets. Mm-hmm. You know, speaking of center, though, you put together a really fantastic piece on Jewel Erickson, that highlighting the season that he has had. Again, break that down for us. What's making a difference in his game this year that he's been such an impactful player in all situations. We've always known he's got the defensive capability and that's what made him a strong player. And they kept kind of hoping that he'd come into his own, but he's definitely found a knack for scoring this year as well. So his shooting percentage, if you looked at his first three full seasons was like less than 7%, you know, it was like bottom 10 in the league among forwards. And it's not just as simple as like, Oh, well the numbers turned around because what goes up or what goes down usually comes up and they regress to the mean. Um, It's his shot location has like, it's slightly shifted as well. Like he's getting much more to like that, that home plate area, mm-hmm. you know, between the circles and the net front. And he always was shooting from there, but it's much, much more concentrated now. So that's a higher percentage chance of shooting. And like, I know there are some people that would look at him and be like, well, he doesn't have this incredible shot and he doesn't, but you mm-hmm. don't need to, if you're constantly putting yourself there, good things will happen if you get to the right areas of the ice. And he is doing consistently um, at five on five. He is the best individual expected goal rate on the team. And, you know, if you played more on the power play, I'm sure it would boost in all situations too. But a big part of it is um, rebounds and second chance opportunities are super valuable in expected goals. And he has, I think like 40% of his expected goal rate or something like that is, you know, from rebound shots. Mm -hmm. And that this series is going to be key because Vegas allows a ton of rebound shots, Mm -hmm. you know, that net front area, they're constantly allowing shots against. So a player like Eric Sinek should thrive because he plays so hard in front of the net. And, you know, the wild don't create a lot of shots for that's going to hurt them. And, and you see that, you know, burning them all the time. 
But if you can constantly, the shots that you do get are quality chances and you see, you know, a team's weakness right there, like it can work for them as long as they still actively are trying to shoot the puck more everywhere else as well. Right. You know, speaking to guys that are crashing the net, uh, Zach Parisi, that's what he was known for. And, and naturally his ice time, big decline. He's been a healthy scratch three times. Probably not likely that you're going to see him much during the playoffs unless there's an injury or something happens and Dean feels the need to switch it up. Um, but Shane, I know you had mentioned somebody had asked you to actually see, does he play better on <laughs> the fourth line than he had been when he was on the first line with Kaprizov or, or even in past seasons? What do those numbers look like for Zach Parise? Is he a better fourth liner? Is he still a guy that, hey, this is why he's clearly sitting out because the numbers just are not there for him? When he was playing higher in the lineup, like the lines were driving play more. And I think that is a result of who you're playing alongside a lot of it, Mm -hmm. but his shooting percentage was better when he was playing on the fourth line. And that's why he was, you know, collecting more points, but there it's it's not like he was driving play more shooting at a higher rate or anything like that. You know, I wanted to look through to see why he was having that success, especially like after he was taken off the power play and wasn't playing there as much like his scoring was ticking up. So you would think Mm -hmm. he's doing something right at five and five. Like, it really felt more like his shooting percentage rebounded. And it's not like he was playing horribly, but at this point, like if he's playing on the fourth line or in and out of the lineup, it feels a little bit more fitting. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Now, I, I love listening to you talk about the numbers because I'm a huge like analytical. I love breaking stuff down and you are providing the actual numbers instead of just the eye test. How did you get into this whole analytical side of sports? And uh, was this something you saw yourself doing or did you just want to get into sports and this is what you ended up falling into? <laughs> I did not think I'd be here at all. Um, (laughs) I finished my undergrad in business and I was going for accounting. Like, oh, that's yeah. There's numbers in that too. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I like math. This is a way more fun way to work with numbers, I (laughs) must say. Yeah. Um, I originally went for journalism and I quit after a month. I hated it. (laughs) So like I, I didn't expect, I took some like sports classes because like for business you were able to, and I was able Mm -hmm. to like apply things to hockey and just try to have fun with it to like pass the time. But um, when I applied for grad school, I was not going for sports. And then my sister went to uh, NYU and they were at like the uh, orientation and there was a Mm -hmm. desk for sports business for grad. And like, they brought home all these papers and were like, here, apply for this. And I was like, (laughs) so eventually like I gave it a shot. And while I was there, like, it's not like we learned anything having to do with this, but anytime we got to do a project, I directed it to hockey, Mm -hmm. started writing about sports technology. And I was like, I never want to be writing about the game. It's going to ruin it for me. I never want to be writing about any of this. And then somehow I'm here. And I got into the numbers because someone told me Anton Stroman's bad. And I was like, well, you're wrong. And they were like, okay, prove it. He has no points. And I'm like, that does not matter for defending. <laughs> you're wrong. So I would go and like war on ice and look up all the charts and the numbers and be like, here, let me tell you how he's wrong. And then a year later, it was Dan Boyle on the team. And, you know, some people were saying he was bad or good and it's like well no he's good at certain things and he has weaknesses in other areas here's the numbers to back it up and then <laughs> um I just kind of started weaving it into my writing and realizing I'm like ah oh, you know maybe like math and hockey is like a nice twist that I could do and here I am I mean is it kind of great to see the NHL is certainly embracing more and more these analytics within their team I mean I think even a lot of fans are starting to educate mm-hmm. themselves on okay what do these numbers mean I know Sarah McClellan of the Star Tribune and I were talking Victor Rask's numbers are actually much better than people perceive him <laughs> to be when he's on the ice too. He's another player that it's like, if you want to look at it and go past the eye test. I mean, how encouraging is that for you to see people embrace this side of the game as much because there is such importance to it. I think it's really fun. And like, I think the more it's used on like broadcasts and stuff like that's huge. And it's, it's learning how to do it. Like you mm-hmm. can, you can throw out every number in the world at someone and it literally does not, you could be as right as humanly possible. If you're not explaining it the right way and making it digestible, it means absolutely nothing. And I think the biggest thing is you have to want to learn about it. If you're an NHL GM, you know, hockey inside and out, nobody's questioning that, but maybe, you know, narratives and you know, things from your playing days or, you know, from what you've seen over the years and you're biased. Like, it, it's hard to say to everyone like, well, I'm sorry, you're biased, but every single person is, it's just the way it is. You know, we watch players and we can see these outstanding offensive plays and then you can go, well, they're actually not doing it that often. They're like, what do you mean? I saw them do. And it's like, mm-hmm. well, they're actually not creating consistently. That highlight play is going to stick in your head every single time you think of this player, but that doesn't mean anything in the grand scheme of it. It's, it's nice that they have flashes of that. Why don't you try to figure out how to get them to do it consistently? So it's nice to see that it's being used in the mainstream a little bit more. So, and it's nice to see too, like, I'm not going to sit here and be like, well, this player's course, he was X. Like, I'm going to say their shot rate. 
Everyone says get pucks on net and, and you just figure out ways to tie it together. And it's nice when you can do it, you know, on a TV broadcast in, the, in an intermission report and you can tie it with video. That is like the mm -hmm. best way to do it. Or if you're in your writing, you can show the numbers and show the graph and then put it in action too with the video. Like it helps so much. So I think it's really great that people are catching on to it a little bit more and hopefully it keeps growing from here and, you know, they're going to have more analytics on the broadcast. So I think it'll help to see that. And a lot of the broadcasters doing it, understand how to use numbers like Alex Faust, like he's really good mm -hmm. at breaking that down from his experience in tennis and his experience mm -hmm. on the Kings broadcast. So to have experienced commentators bring that in, like, I think that'll be really helpful too in the long run. I mean, I think even in the written word, as you do it with the athletic, right, mm -hmm. it helps support any arguments that I would make or Russo would make or whomever, right, to say, okay, this is why we're saying this, we're saying yeah. it. But I imagine there still has to be a balance, right, within using the numbers when evaluating a player. I always go back to Moneyball, which was probably the first mm -hmm. movie that introduced me to the importance of analytics, right, and how you, you know, yes, you can say a guy does X, Y, Z all on the numbers, but there's still other athletic elements that need oh, to be yeah. taken into consideration, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. Like so many people are like, Oh, watch the game. And it's like, okay, <laughs> most of these are taken from watching the game. You know, like, yes, people just generate it with spreadsheets and they have algorithms to do that. But when you look at things like you're talking about zone entries, like you're going to go back and watch for all of those zone, zone entries. So you're tying it to it. And I don't think it's fair to do analysis unless you're doing like a quick thing. You're like, all right, mm -hmm. let me look at the probability of Vegas winning, run it through and whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you're getting into anything kind of deep, it, it, it helps to, to know exactly what you're talking about and be able to tie it to what you're seeing. You know, like sometimes numbers can help bring questions that you don't see. Like maybe they're failing to enter the zone on the power play, you know, 80% of the time. And you're like, wait, what's going on there? And now it brings a question that you're like, I thought they were doing it well, but maybe it's just on the scoring play. So my brain's going there. But then you watch and you see they're targeting the same time, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the same spot every single time and everyone's caught onto it and it's not working. So it definitely helps to tie it together and try to use that to spark questions and then use it to support things that you're seeing as well without pushing the, nar the numbers to fit your narrative. Because that's like mm -hmm. the trickiest part of it. Like I know that's such an easy trap mm -hmm. to be like, well, let me prove to you how this player is good and then bring out 10 numbers that like suit your narrative. Like you don't want to do that, obviously. You've but... read my work then. So. <laughs> <laughs> I love your work. I know. Once in a while I'm like, but this is the story I want to tell. So that's what yeah. I want to go with. But yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. It, it's just hard to find. You want to find that balance. And I think, you know, the more in tune you are with the team, the easier it is for you to find the balance consistently. Well, and Shana, as, as someone who, who works uh, in numbers and analysis and all of that, uh, I know this might be a tough question, but I'm sure you're thinking about it. Uh, who's maybe a dark horse for the playoffs? Uh, as someone who is looking at these numbers, are we, is there a team that maybe everyone's overlooking that is maybe going to have some more playoff success than we're thinking? I want to say the wild a little bit, you know, like, <laughs> I think that everyone looks at the gold. Is that unbiasly? You're yeah, not just saying that you to You don't nice have to, us, to right? cater to us. No, Shana. no. I think, I think they're the team. Everybody's going to, was looking at Colorado or Vegas and going like, mm -hmm. they're going to win. And I see every reason why you would go, you know, if it was Colorado, I think right. it'd be a little bit different of a story because they're dominant in every single way. But Vegas has holes. They're a really mm -hmm. good team and they play a totally different style, but they do have holes that I think Minnesota could exploit, even though they don't shoot the puck very much, you know, mm -hmm. their defensive structure helps. And I think the other one that intrigues me is um, Carolina, you know, mm -hmm. yes. If you look at their matchup against Nashville, you could easily go, well, Nashville's way better. UC Soros is carrying those predators. They were selling at the deadline for a reason. <laughs> he, you know, he came back from injury and within three games wiped out his first half of the season in mm -hmm. terms of like goal saved above expectations. Like he literally, it, it, he, he saved, seven goals in three games. That's what he had allowed to that point. And now he's one of the best goalies in the league. He had this amazing turnaround. I don't think the team behind in front of him is very good. And I think Carolina in all facets, you know, they are, and some might look to their goaltending and go, well, they're a little bit weaker, but Nadelkovic has been incredible. And Mrazic when he's on is really good. And then you still have James Reimer. Like you have three skilled goalies with this unbelievable team in front of them. So I would say if Carolina isn't viewed as a favorite, because maybe they weren't that like perennial contender that mm -hmm. Nashville was for a few years, then you're looking at it wrong. So yeah, let me ask you this then, Shana. When you're analyzing, you know, the numbers for playoff hockey, are you looking at just previous playoff seasons for that team? Or are you taking regular season into consideration as well? I mean, what's the balance there? Because obviously regular season and playoff hockey, there's differences just based on the eye test. I'm sure the numbers reflect that as well. But how do you kind of analyze what makes a team maybe a good playoff contender in a season? I try to stick to the regular season because I don't think it's fair to look at 
their past seasons when it's a different team. You know, mm-hmm. you see, you can see how much growth there can be. Like a team like Tampa, they made it to the playoffs after an outstanding regular season. Everyone had them as the winner, and then you know Columbus was able to sweep them. Mm-hmm. The next year, they did come into it and learned what they were doing wrong and built on what they had already done in the regular season. I think it's nice to look back. Like maybe you do want to look back at a player like I don't know. Sergey Bobrovsky in the playoffs mm-hmm. and go, well, you know, he hasn't been great in those clutch situ- situations and try to break it down. Or you look at someone like, you know, the Rangers, whenever they were this mediocre team, but they had Henrik Lundqvist that you were like, you mm-hmm. know, I can look at past playoff performances and he carried them and I think he's going to do it again. But I think like for talking this year, you mm-hmm. know, specifically the Maple Leafs are the team everyone's going to point to and be like, well, look at what they did in the playoffs because everything is how, did, how does it affect the Leafs? Yeah. We have to bring them up. Um, but yeah, they, they, had, they, they don't have a great playoff record. They haven't won a series in, you know, years. But this is a much better team than they have been in years past, and they're finally a little bit more well-rounded than they were before. So I do want to look at it, and I can, you know, in the back of my mind, I'm like, they're still mm-hmm. the Leafs. But I also look at it and go, this is the best Leafs team they've put together, mm-hmm. and this is their strengths from the regular season. These are their weaknesses, and here's how I think it'll go against Montreal. So there, are they the ones that you think will win the Cup at the end of no. the day? I mean, no. no. Who's, no. Who, right, is so <laughs> who is it? Let's go. <laughs> Um, my pick right now would probably be Colorado or Carolina. I think Colorado, you have three Norris caliber defensemen <laughs> and you're not even at that point. You're not talking about Philip Grubauer and Nett, who's great. You're not <laughs> talking about McKinnon. Like there's yeah. so many, they, they address their depth. There's so many good yeah. things about that team and they are just dominant. They took off in like mid season and they just like never came back because everything is so good there. Yeah, um, tell us about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's the thing right there. Like, if they were playing Minnesota in round one, like, I would genuinely be worried, even though, like, we've seen yeah. Minnesota beat them in dominant games this year, too. Mm-hmm. But that Colorado team, top to bottom, like, they built a contender. They're going to be good for now and long term. And while they still have players cheap like McCarr, like, y- you have to go for it. Would you be surprised if the Blues – would you consider that an upset? I know we had Elliot Friedman on back and he said, you know, if the Minnesota wild were to beat Colorado that he didn't see as an upset, he thought that that was just a fairly easy match. Would you see the blues being as an upset if they were to take out Colorado in the first round? Yeah. Yeah. The blues, like, <laughs> I don't, I think Jordan Bennington's like an average goalie at best. He's had a really good defense in front of him. And when he doesn't, he's not that good. Um, their power play the second half of the season has been unbelievable. Yeah. But the only difference is their shooting percentage from the first half of the year. They have not changed their shot quality. They have not changed their shot quantity. It's all about their shooting percentage. It's going to swing back down. And if it gets closer to the average, their power play is still going to be good, but it's not going to be nearly what it was. Um, they have a lot, of, a lot of good players there. But, you mm-hmm. know, like, there's no question. But I just think Colorado, you look at, you measure apples to apples in each, you know, each part of their team, and Colorado is just that much stronger. And then we got to conclude with obviously the series that you had mentioned is one of the most exciting first round matchups with the wild in Vegas. And we obviously touched on it. Who comes out ahead in that series and how many games is it going to take for a winner to be decided? Cause I could see it going to seven. Usually yeah. sadly with the wild, we're like, ah, four games. Four That's five. all they ever get. They only give us four, but this one, I mean, I think it'll be up to seven games to decide. Yeah. I, I definitely see them going seven. You watch their like season against each other. Yeah. And every game is so close. They, they've been some of the most fun matchups. Um, that's really hard because this is a really good Vegas team. And like they have both goaltenders healthy and Flurry's mm-hmm. put on this like incredible season. I think Minnesota can exploit them. I think that if they can keep up with that, like net front, you know, pressure that we'll see it swing a little towards Minnesota. I give a very slight edge to Vegas because you know, they're one of the best teams at, you know, generating offense and things like that. But I just kind of feel like, I don't know, like I look at Vegas and last year, they made that coaching change. And a lot of it was just because of goaltending. Like they had a bad string of goaltending and they, they made a change. And I think that they were actually like better in some regards last year. And that pressure is on, you know, they keep going for right now players like Alex Petrangelo, that I kind of feel like I can see them crumbling by that seventh game in Minnesota, like taking it on. And then there's so much pressure on, them yeah. to make another change that makes sense I love it I mean so it's gonna be a good series I'm yeah. excited I know we're all excited obviously follow Shana Shana where can people follow you and catch up on all of your good stuff I know you mentioned you've got some Minnesota themed articles coming out with the athletic as well um you can find my writing on the athletic and you know we're trying to get back to podcasting with too many men and everything I post on Twitter and you can find me it's um H A Y Y Y and then Shay with three Y's because I never changed my handle from high school. So <laughs> it's every podcast Classic. I go and I have to say it and I'm like 
at least it's not gorgeous. That would have been mine still. Or <laughs> so, I mean, those are my AIMs, which I'm sure you guys are too young to even know. Nope, I had that. Anyway. <laughs> okay, I had good. those. I and didn't. I have to plug too. You guys have always commented on my North Stars mask, on my Whalers mask. Shayna made those. So certainly hit up her store. That's on an Etsy store, right, Shayna? Yep. Yep. And it's uh, linked on my Twitter too. It's all under the same name for like consistency. And there's North Stars, Vikings, and Wild Scrunchies. And now like these little zipper pouches in, in addition to masks. I love it. It's And it's great. They're comfortable. They look awesome. <laughs> People are always constantly asking me for them. So go check it out. Shayna, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for breaking down the numbers that I usually have no idea what they mean. So <laughs> Thanks for having me. Them. No problem. We're going to take another quick break. We'll be right back. Hey guys, this is producer Fred. I just want to ask everyone to go out there and spread the word about Bar Down Beauties. Leave us a like, share, thumbs up, review, you name it, we want to hear from you. Find us on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and of course, your favorite podcast app. We're back. Thanks again to Shana for joining us and breaking down those numbers. Uh, pretty exciting stuff, especially when you see that not only are the wild passing our eye tests, but they've mm -hmm. got some numbers to support it too. So very exciting there. Thanks again to her. And be sure to go buy a mask or scrunchie or tea yeah. from her. She's got some really cool stuff on her Etsy thing. I'm not just saying that because I wear it all the time, but yeah. I mean it. It's it's pretty neat. So be sure to give that a look and, and follow her on Twitter and check out Too Many Men, another great podcast driven by some females who know their stuff like us. So Let's dive into our final segment, up for debate, postseason leader, Alexis. How did you select the three players that you did select? Um, well, I had to go with Eric Sinek because he's uh, really had a breakout season here and it impressed a lot of people. Kevin Fiala obviously has had a great season as well. And can we do anything talking about scoring without putting Kuro Kaprizov in it? No. So that was my third one. Um, and so really you could have picked a lot of different people to put on here because it, it sometimes surprises you who ends up standing out in the playoffs and who ends up carrying the team and helping get the team wins. Um, but I, I went with three that I think are, are maybe obvious ones and just wanted to see what people thought. And I was hoping people weren't all just going to pick a pre -sop. I wanted like actual arguments, like give me reasons why it might be somebody other than him. And there was a couple people who, who gave some good arguments. Uh, Jesse, I'll let you lead the way though. Which one do you think Dream is, is going to is going to get the uh, lead in scoring. Kirill Kaprizov. No. Ah, come <laughs> on, here. man. I am here for that storyline and that storyline yeah. only, baby. Like, I'm. that's what I want. I uh, No, I mean, in all complete honesty, I bet it's not any of the three of them. Because like you mentioned, playoffs are always a time of magic. So you're yeah. going to see somebody step up and all of a sudden be like, holy cow, when did they learn how to be? Yeah. It's a Jonas Brodeen or, you know, maybe it's a Greenway. Maybe it's a Felino. But yeah. of those three, I would say Kaprizov just because mm -hmm. I love that. I love that kind of cherry on top of the season for him, whatever this might end, you know, just in general in the postseason. So give me number 97 with all of the points. Well, I'm glad you said that because I have a slightly different answer that may surprise some people. Um, I, I think for some reason, I just get this feeling that it's not going to be Kaprizov. Um, and I feel torn even thinking that. And the reason that I feel like it might not be Kaprizov, and I actually saw somebody comment, literally my exact thoughts, um, someone commented it uh, on the tweet, is that uh, Kaprizov is obviously going to be the main target. Whether the Wild make it out of the first round, make it all the way to the final, whatever it is. The, any team the Wild play against in the postseason are going to know Kaprizov is the guy mm -hmm. to stop. Therefore, totally. he's going to get a lot of attention on the ice. He's going to be targeted. They're going to try to shut him down. They're going to try Try to bother him and annoy him and steal the puck from him and even though it's hard to get him off of his game that's not an easy thing to do uh, but I think the teams the wild will play in the postseason are going to be relentless on that as they should be it's what you saw um, with Kevin Fiala last year exactly right? yeah and so I think that because of that we might see other players start to shine a little bit more than Kaprizov in the playoffs as far as scoring goes Kaprizov still going to have his magic touch as far as you know his hockey IQ and the way he generates plays is he going to be the one who's putting the puck in the back of the net the most that I'm not so sure of, but I will also say this on the flip side of that, when you get to the playoffs, you need your star players to be your star players. I've said that before. So you need Kirill Kaprizov to be your star player. He's your star player and he needs to contribute in the postseason. Um, but on the third flip side of that, there's three sides to this coin. Um, he's only a rookie. So you never know how they might handle their first NHL playoff series um, or NHL postseason. Um, and so because of that, I don't want to set too high of a bar for him. Just seeing how well he's performed in the regular season, that might translate a little bit differently in his first postseason matchups. Um, but I would love to see him do well, although uh, I do know he's going to be heavily targeted by uh, by Minnesota Wild opponents in the postseason. 
I mean, I don't disagree with you there. I mean, certainly it's either way. You can't go. Somebody better lead this team. Yeah. I want somebody putting up the points. I want to put it on want... their back. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's like Ryan Hartman. Like somebody literally just, com- maybe it's Victor Rask. No, it's not. I, <laughs> no, it's not. It's not going to be Victor Rask. I'll tell you that right now. It, it could be anybody but Victor Rask. I, you know, I, Cam Talbot has a better chance of leading the team in points in the postseason than Victor Rask does. And that's just that on that. When I'm not chirping Dean Evson about Capo Kakinen's, um, letting in nine goals and not forgetting that I have been asking him about Victor Rask, like kind of religiously <laughs> because I need like an answer. Like yeah. I need, to, I'm trying to do the people's work here. Um, but Dean just loves him. And as we had kind of alluded to with, with Shana and I'll have to look up those numbers. I, I mean, if we look at it analytically, Rask is better than any of us give him credit for. And Dean loves him because he's calm and can, can do things. And so maybe it is, maybe, you know, let's calm little... as in unnoticeable calm as in just sits in the corner. Calm as the in overtime winner anything. against Anaheim. The other uh, yeah. The game before that, I'm pretty sure they literally specifically lost because he was on ice in overtime. So I mean... Maybe we won't get into it. It's fine. I don't have enough time to be angry about this. (laughs) (laughs) That's going to do it for this week's episode. As always, thank you so much to our presenting sponsor, Soda Stick. Don't forget that you can get free shipping with Bar Down Beauty's code at checkout. Also shout out to Jim Beam. Cheers to them. I'm sure plenty of people will be taking a nice shot of uh, bourbon whiskey out of a Jim Beam glass during the playoffs. Also, Better Edge, again, B-E-T-T-O-R edge.com. Come beat the butte. Get your free 10 bucks to bet with and uh, let's have a little fun. Tony Hoagland, you're also the best and Talk North for featuring us on their lovely network. And thank you to all of you, all of our listeners, all of our comments. It gets bigger and better every single week and I'm not just saying (laughs) that. Like, that's so exciting. I love all of our YouTube comments. You guys are the best. I know Fred loves translating them and telling us (laughs) what beautiful girls we are. So we really do appreciate that. You guys are awesome. Um, And uh, be sure you subscribe, rate, share with your friends, give us a follow on socials and uh, keep supporting us throughout all of this. We like it. We love it. We want more of it. (laughs) Right? That's a song in case you guys didn't know. Yes, it is. All right. Go check out our cues at the Buttes. We'll see you next week.